When I was first in IPCC, which is almost 20 years ago now, the big questions were, were very basic. Are species being affected by climate change? If so, how many? And how do we know that the changes we're seeing are actually being driven by climate change and not habitat destruction or one of the many other things that we know affects species, wild species? And so those, thank you. Oh, that's much better. So those early analyses that we, we did were really focused on very, very basic questions. And the start is, uh, how do you know that climate change is driving the effect, which is what we call an attribution question? You want to start by asking, well, what do we expect? And if you go back to paleo evidence and look at past major climate changes, what you see is that species shifted polewards and upwards. Very simplistic, but if this is what we see, it's, it's a, a, a very nice uh, repetition of what's happened during fat past major climate changes. So that's what we looked for initially. And it went too fast. Uh, and if you look at this map of the actual climate change that we've seen in the last 50 years, what you notice is the land has warmed quite a bit more than the ocean in an absolute sense. And so the first uh, analyses of, of species around the globe, so these are big syntheses of all the data we can find from all the species that we can get data for, uh, put into what are we call meta-analysis. Those early ones, including my own, were focused on land species, terrestrial species, because really that's, it was assumed that's where the big changes were going to be happening. But I was very pleased to be invited to be part of a group more recently that focused only on marine species. And one of the first analyses we did showed that even though oceans aren't warming as much in an absolute sense, because in an ocean you've got to move a very long way before the temperature changes, if you get a little bit of warming and you're an organism who wants to stay in a fixed temperature, you've got to move a very long way in order to maintain that temperature. So when we put the data together for the species, it really was no big surprise that we're actually seeing much larger rain changes in ocean species than we are for land species. Uh, 75 kilometers per decade shift poleward versus 6 and 17. But if you look at the extremes, we're seeing even larger shifts. So th that's the averages. It has a lot of things that aren't moving. If we look at the extremes, we're seeing things like the purple emperor butterfly moving 200 kilometers in just five years. Atlantic cod moving more than 200 kilometers in a decade. And this particular uh, diatom, an algae, moving more than 400 kilometers in just one decade. So we're seeing some amazingly rapid rain shifts, and those are very, very well correlated to the temperature changes we're seeing in the regions where they live. Now, we are starting to see negative impacts, even at the 0.8 degrees centigrade that we've had already. We're seeing that species in the coldest habitats at the poles, and uh, the reason I'm showing this butterfly is it's also the mountaintop species. It's not just polar species. Things in the coldest environments, uh, like mountaintop species, their lowest elevation populations are going extinct. Like the Apollo butterfly, this is happening both in France and in Nepal. The pika, which is uh, actually related to a rabbit, <laughs> a very cute little thing. It's a very high elevation uh, a species that already lives at the top of the mountains. Its lower elevation populations are going extinct, both the American pika in the USA, in Canada, and also a related different species in Nepal. And so its, contra its range is contracting, getting more and more confined to just the highest mountaintops. Uh, this is also happening in the tropical mountaintops in Australia. The white lemuroid possum was actually believed to be extinct a few years ago. They have now found two individuals, not two populations, two individuals, and it's not expected to last. And we're starting to see the first extinctions. Uh, one of the very first was the golden toad, and we've more recently had um, a small mammal go extinct on a low-lying um, oceanic island that simply got flooded over. Now, the other major type of change we're seeing, which we expected and we're seeing, is changes in seasonality. So earlier spring. Uh, and we've got enough data here where we can start seeing differences amongst groups. So amphibians are responding the fastest. And birds and butterflies are responding faster than the plants on which they feed. And in the marine system, fish and zooplankton are responding faster than our phytoplankton. 
So if you notice the way I've been saying this, what we're starting to see is predator-prey systems, plant pollinator systems, plant insect systems, maybe starting to get out of sync because they're not all shifting earlier at exactly the same rate. Now, when you put all this data together, these are the five major global meta-analyses that we have to date. Uh, and as I said, the very last one uh, that we did was entirely marine. And I do want to point out that the very best marine data, the most long-term and best quality data, comes out of Plymouth, both through the university, the Marine Biological Association, SAFOS, and Plymouth Marine Labs. And it was interesting, because I always had this impression when I first started working on this some 15 years ago, but in doing this marine analysis recently, being surrounded by marine biologists, I found out that, you know, although there are data sets from around the globe, that Plymouth still has the very best ones for the North Atlantic, North Sea, and coastal areas. So all of this information got fed into uh, the policy process. So as, as a lead author in IPCC and as a contributing author in the most recent report, we were able to get this latest literature into the IPCC reports that got filtered to the policymakers. And these kind, this kind of information, these kind of results, not only from biology, but from other sectors as well, health sectors, economic sectors, all brought together and uh, were filtered up to policymakers and came together to lead to this declaration of a two degree centigrade warming as being considered the threshold beyond which we would have dangerous climate change. So when I was at COP15, and I, everyone thinks COP15 was a failure, I thought it was a success because it actually put a threshold in, it put a number in, two degrees. And at that time, remember this was back in, oh, what was it, 2009? Um, at that time, I thought two degrees was a good number. You know, from the work that I had done looking at, at uh, changes, observed changes to recent climate change around the world, we've seen changes to 0.8 degrees, a few negative impacts in the most sensitive systems, and I thought, okay, you know, you, you, you triple that, and, you know, I think we can still have more or less the, the uh, ecosystems that we have, and we'll simply lose some of the most sensitive ones. So I was really happy with COP15. But since then, more research, more sophisticated, sort of deeper level research has shown that many of the species in those early meta-analyses that we put down as being non-responders, so having no change, or even going counter to what we expect, so we expect to shift uphill and maybe they went downhill. And these weren't that many species, less than 20%. So um, it didn't affect the big overall picture, but in one analysis that I was involved in, for example, with uh, looking at, at changes in timing of spring flowering in UK plants, actually this is a bit, very nice long-term UK data set, what we found is 75% of the species respond only to spring and they respond to spring warming by by um, leafing out earlier like the field maple. Okay, that's, that's the big number, that's the vast majority, and that's what goes into those big meta-analysis and gives us such a strong signal. But another 20%, so the rest of the data set, almost all of them were showing no response, and yet when we did a more detailed analysis, we found out they were responding very strongly to temperature changes, just in a more sophisticated way than we expected. So there were species like the old man's beard that required a cold winter chill to sort of reset their timing, something called vernalization. And so what happened is they responded to warming springs by advancing their blooming, but they responded to warming winters by delaying their blooming. They were waiting for the winter to get colder before they decided to come out of their winter dormancy. And when you put those two together, you see no response. So we thought they weren't sensitive to climate change, and in fact, they're very sensitive to climate change, just as sensitive as this you know, vast majority that are blooming earlier. So this led, and this was happening with other types of data sets, so sort of weird responses that suddenly we're able to understand as we learn more about the physiology or the ecology of the organisms. So a lot of us started getting quite worried that two degrees may be too much, that we really weren't understanding well enough uh, what was going on, and the big meta-analyses had very strong results, but they were perhaps giving us too rosy a picture. <clears throat> 
So, you know, what uh, the kind of summaries I've put together before would say, you know, half of species have changed where they live and two thirds of species have changed when they live. And these are very powerful numbers. We're up to about 4,000 species now. Um, but now we know those are underestimates. And the trouble is we don't know how much we've underestimated the response. So I was extremely pleased. Um, I was at a pre-COP scientific conference last July where a lot of us were presenting this kind of information from different uh, points of view and from different systems. And all of us thought, well, we're not going to change the two degrees. Once you get global agreement on something, there, you know, it's set in stone. There's no way it was going to change. So I was absolutely overjoyed last December when in COP21, uh, a group of uh, called the Climate Vulnerability Forum came up. There were small island states, also countries that were very vulnerable to climate change. Um, and they had fortunately a great leader, Fabius, uh, within, uh, who was within the um, governing council for that particular conference. And they not only maintained the two degrees, so the, the, the COP15 accord is like a page and a half. You can really easily read it. This is 30 pages. So it's very long, but if you get to like page 21, you see, okay, they still want to limit climate change to two degrees, but now they're allowing for a, a new goal that in the future we should actually try for 1.5. Now, the that's fantastic. The trouble is, if you look at the emissions targets, it's going towards three degrees by the end of the century. So we're not doing what we say, uh, which means that as biologists now, what we focused on in the past, um, I've been focusing on observed impacts, you know, what have we seen with 0.8 degrees warming, people modeling into the future, quite frankly, have really been focusing on four and six degree warming, the more extreme to try to see, you know, what would happen if we go to these business as usual scenarios. And now what's very clear is we actually need to focus on these smaller levels of climate change. And one way of doing that is by digging deeper into the basic biology of the organisms, like Professor Dave Bilton is doing. He's coming from a very physiological approach, and what he's done with lab experiments on temperature tolerance is he's found that the actual geographic position, size of uh, and the geographic size of, of a species range in the wild is very, very tightly related to the results he finds in the lab as to their absolute temperature tolerances, their maximum and minimum temperature tolerances. And very interestingly, they don't get used to it. So it's, if you keep it warm, they don't get used to being warm and suddenly shift their basic tolerances. It's a very fundamental physiological limitation as to where they can live. And as you heard Mick Hanley talk about, I'm not going to talk about this in detail because Mick gave just a lovely summary of this. Uh, Mick Hanley and, and Rich Bowden and others are working on what's the impact of rising, uh, increasing storm surge and increasing duration of coastal flooding on the vegetation communities along our coast. Uh, Paul Ramsey <laughs> is working uh, both up in the high Andes, looking on effects of climate change on these high Andean systems, uh, what are the impacts of changing fire frequency, and what he's starting on now is to look for climate refugia. Are there areas in the Andes that actually could help preserve some of these species from being knocked off the top of the mountains? And more locally, he's working on impacts of climate change in British woodlands using citizen science data, which I think is incredibly important because in order to get responses from our policymakers, it's very important that citizens be informed. What better way to be informed than to be going out and gathering the data yourself? And finally, it's not all negative. So Rob Puschendorf has, has a, just a fantastic long-term research program looking at the re in interaction between infectious disease and climate change, particularly in amphibians, who are a very sensitive uh, group. They tend to sort of be knocked down by pretty much anything that humans do. And what he found is he helped to document that indeed a uh, warming climate often does interact with the disease to make things worse and cause declines and even extinctions of populations. But what I find really cool is the positive aspects that he found areas where uh, 
even where you have the disease, if the climate is marginal, so areas that used to be considered marginal for the species are actually the areas where these species are doing brilliantly, like the harlequin frog in Costa Rica, the waterfall frog in Australia, in the drier parts of their range. And the chytrid fungus is there, this is the main disease killing off amphibians around the world, but it's not causing these populations to decline. And so the idea is that although climate can make infectious disease work, you know, the extremes of climate, the marginal areas of climate can actually provide a refuge for many of these species. And in my own work, uh, and this is in collaboration with Professor Mike Singer at Plymouth, uh, what we found is we expected this endangered species, Kino checker spot, to go extinct because it's lost almost all its habitat in Southern California from the rise of Los Angeles and San Diego. You weren't supposed to do that. Um, and it's lost almost all of its habitat down in Baja, Mexico, which is not developed. Habitat looks beautiful, but it's climatically unsuitable. So we said, look, here's the classic conservation problem, species being squeezed between development and climate change. It's not gonna make it. It did make it by moving up the mountains, which we didn't expect because it was already at the top of its range limit of its host plant, and it did it by shifting host plants. Fabulous, marvelous. So what happens in the future? Even if we look just 30 years from now, which is about a two degree scenario, what we find is right now, it's already gotten to the tops of those mountains, so it's shifted upwards hundreds of feet. It's already at the top. What we see in this modeling is that it, just in another 20 years, it will lose all its habitat in Southern California, and it will only be present up, um, it will have to shift up to the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a shift of several hundred kilometers that quite frankly, it's not gonna make. So what all of this, if you put all of this work together into a framework, what you see is that 0.8 degrees warming, which we've already had, many species can adapt and are adapting. The amphibians around the world the uh, butterflies around the world. But even if you get to two degrees, you're starting to lose many of these species. The implication then is that at 1.5 degrees, we really may be able to save quite a few species. So what we need now is more detailed research on these much smaller levels of warming and the finer responses of uh, the ecology and physiology of species in order to preserve biodiversity. Thank you very much.